to do. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, and with that, I will share the screen. I find the screen sharing thing. Okay, can everybody see that? Oops, not yet. Hang on, one button missing. Now can everybody see that? Looks good. Okay, so welcome folks to the October, where is this year gone, <clears throat> monthly meeting of the Seattle Robotics Society. The recording has started. Okay. So first up, our video is being recorded by Zoom. Um, if you have your microphone going, um, please mute it and keep that going. Uh, we'll keep to kind of the general agenda. We'll do, you know, pretty much this uh, this whole thing here, the welcome, club business, events of note, uh, today's presentation and future presentations. Uh, we don't have any Robothon updates at the moment. We just did one and uh, we're actually having our group meeting Monday, so there's not much there. And down the list. So, let's see. Yep, there's muting of the microphones. Um, hopefully everybody's got their microphone muted. The way Zoom works, I can't actually see at the moment, because I'm sharing my screen. Uh, club business. Um, we do have the new first wall facility. We're still talking about um, going back to a hybrid format. Uh, it's kind of not looking like we have enough interest. Um, at the moment, there was about five people who were interested. What the hybrid would look at would look like is maybe a couple people at the facility and everybody else remote, <clears throat> and uh, that still kind of leaves everybody remote. So what we are talking about for next year is doing a at least one and maybe a couple of special events at the field at the new uh, field house, and so it'd be you know either one of the monthly meetings or after the monthly meeting, you know, have a, um, everybody kind of comes down and brings a robot or does a workshop or whatever we decide to do. If folks have something they would like to see us do in that space and venue, uh, please let me know. Uh, we'll be talking about it as a group tomorrow night. Now that's kind of where we're at with the, uh, the remote meetings and the hybrid meetings and uh, various activities. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Steve is uh, currently hosting these meetings from Idaho, except for today and for about the next six months. Um, I, I kind of stepped in to kind of help with this. Uh, if anybody else would like to uh, help run the meetings on occasion, let me know. And uh, let me, myself and Steve know. <clears throat> I think I'm good for the next couple of months, but um, just in case there's a backup, you know, It'd be good to have somebody backing me up just in case. Uh, let's see. Yep, that's the slide I just covered. <laughs> okay. And yep, we're still going to stream in-person meetings. Um, I kind of covered this already as well. This is our talk, you know, various talking about going back to hybrid. We'll come back to come back to that as uh, interest. Um, increases, decreases, whatever. We have a way to do it. It's just our people interested enough to, to actually make it viable. Okay, past events. I'm going to skip that one. Um, makerspaces. There's the Snowco Makerspace in Everett, the KCLS Makerspaces, the ones in Federate, Federal Way. There's actually one in Bellevue that's not listed here. Um, the Korea Makerspace in Renton, Seattle Makerspace you know, in Seattle. Um, Airtight light time space. That looks interesting. There's one up in the north end. Anybody has uh, more of those? Get, it. Get Steve to add it to the list. Uh, let's see. Robo Games is in Pleasanton, California. I'm not sure if that's happened already or not. The uh, Snowco Makerspace uh, event happened last weekend. Or excuse me. The, uh, yeah, there was a Maker Fair up in uh, Everett last weekend. I think that's the slide out of date. Uh, Robothon committee. Uh, as I said, we're going to meet tomorrow night. We're all, uh, we are looking for more people to kind of join that at the moment. If anybody's interested in helping out with Robothon, um, let myself, 
Yeah. Let myself know. And uh, let's see. Oh, I put an email in there. Uh, if you want to let me know, my email is M O O R E L number three at Comcast.net. Let me get Steve to add that. Okay, Steve is looking for presenters. We're good through, let's see. Let's see. We're good through February of next year. So if you've got something you would like to present, it uh, doesn't have to be super, you know, technically depth uh, or technical in depth. It could even be kind of a, you know, an ethics where are we headed? Is this good for society type of talk? Um, let, uh, let Steve know at Seattle Robotics Society at gmail.com. Um, if you want to get involved in the Robothon stuff, you can also use that email and Steve will route it to me. If we don't have speakers uh, on a particular topic, we can always do any one of these uh, open discussion forums. We've got a couple of these planned. And so bio-inspired robots and how robotics helps people and, and so forth. <clears throat> um, if you'd like to host one of those, also let Steve know. Uh, the growing skills shortage is always one of my favorites. Uh, I'm actually... Uh, in a role at the moment where I'm kind of helping with that. And I'll tell you, there's very little uh, little supply out there for really skilled workers. Uh, I'm living that one firsthand these days. Uh, let's see, 20, uh, 2023, 2024. So today we have Michael Franklin Reynolds talking about microbotics, nanobots, and so forth. Um, next month, I'm going to be doing the title on this one isn't quite right. Software development changes over the years. It's actually titled What We Have Lost. So this will be a look back at um, how software development has changed over the years and some of the techniques that are still relevant today. Uh, December's Bio-Inspired Robots. Uh, January 2024. Ooh, Washington Embodied Intel Robotics Dev Lab. That sounds like fun. And then on February, uh, Bob Cook is going to talk about his Robo Magellan robot. So March through the rest of next year is open. If you've got a talk, love to hear from you. Today is uh, so is um, Michael Franklin Reynolds on microbotics, nanobots, etc. So um, I haven't seen him. I'm not sure if he's here yet. He he was going to show up right about right before 11. So nope, not showing him here yet. <clears throat> okay, so um, we'll do around the room. Um, let's see. Does anyone have anything they would like to share? I'm going to stop sharing here real quick so I can see the screens. Okay. Yep. Does anyone have anything for around the room? I don't know, James. If I don't know if the uh, oh, somebody. Somebody's got a hand up. Who had a hand up? I you just took it down. I couldn't see who it was. Oh, sorry, that was me. I, I wasn't sure if you wanted me to do a quick demo of that cardiac thing, or if you want to wait until next uh, month, which is perfectly okay with me. But I did find it, posted it into the chat, so it's there if anybody wants to check it out. Oh, great! Tell you what, let's let's um, maybe a little bit of both. I I don't think. How, how many? Do we have anybody else wanting to do speaker stuff today? or want to do around the room today, excuse me. Let's go ahead and dive into that and use it to catalyze a little bit, and then maybe we can just mention it again uh, next month. Let's see whether or not I can figure out how to do this. Okay. Uh, and by this, I mean operate a computer. <laughs> they yep. keep making it more difficult. Um, I know. Actually, that's something I'm going to talk about next month. <laughs> yeah. So this is, uh, just to give credit where it's due, um, this absolutely uh, excellent uh, simulator that was written um, and is hosted at Drexel. Uh, I don't remember exactly who it was that did it, but there's a nice description there you can find out. And then the only thing that I did was I added um, this, this block diagram that you see up here. Uh, using uh, an online tool called uh, SVG Edit, which I, I really like. Uh, it's buggy as hell, but <laughs> if, if you 
kind of stick with it, you can get there. Uh, this is hosted on GitHub, <laughs> which, which is still up. Microsoft hasn't killed it yet. And um, so this is uh, currently available along with all the source code. That's the, the scan of the original um, logo. But the idea here is that you, you have this computer, very simple, um, just has uh, access to a memory block over here, uh, 99 hole um, instruction, uh, or excuse me, memory slots. And each one holds three decimal digits because it's a decimal computer. Um, memory comes into an instruction register that gets decoded. There's a program counter that can be updated from the instruction register potentially. <clears throat> and then there's a, a memory address bus, which selects which of these. The one that's currently selected is always highlighted. Um, and then there is the memory uh, input also goes into an ALU, um, which then runs an accumulator. And the accumulator is the other input to the ALU. I mean, that's pretty standard architecture. And then the accumulator can be written back out to the, to the memory bus. Um, the simulator is gives you a deck, which is, of course, <laughs> your paper tape or, you know, punch card or whatever. Um, I was just at the Computer History Museum uh, Wednesday. And so I'm just, I'm like steeped in the whole, like, history of it. I got a punch card. I got my name printed on fan fold paper. Um, <laughs> just okay so i have to tell you really quick this is so cool they have an ibm 14 something or other room there and they have these uh line printers <clears throat> they're a uh, they're chain based each one of the little characters on the chain that goes horizontally around and then there are uh, like 132 hammers that hit the the right thing as it goes by uh, and they print very quickly they're lubricated with oil one of the printers has an oil leak so what they do is they just take a box of fan fold paper and they put it underneath the leak. And oh, it, just soaks up. it just soaks up in the fan fold paper. I mean, that's not a fire hazard or anything. Um, no, not at all. <laughs> but the key point is that uh, oh, and it's also it's on a raised floor, right? So you walk into this room and you walk up the ramp, which triggers a memory. And then you're looking at the raised floor, which triggers a memory. And then the smell of the printer oil hits you. And it's like, I can't describe how powerful a feeling. Now, for me, it was an HP 3000 Series 3. Yep. Um, but it's just like walking into the same room with the same smells, with the same everything. It was pretty amazing. And I was pointing that out to the guy, and he was telling me about how they were using a box of paper. And I said, dude, can I have a piece of that oil-soaked paper? And <laughs> he, he kind of looked at me weird, but he tore it off and gave it to me. And... and uh, he gave me a, a paper bag to, to transport it in. So I now have an oil soaked piece of paper <laughs> from an IBM line printer um, that I have in, in now in a little plastic bag. And whenever I want a little hit of memory, I can just crack open the bag and smell it. I, I, I'm not sure I should have shared that story because I think it makes me sound really weird. But anyway, that, that's, that's okay, James. I, I, I've been in that room many years ago. And uh -huh. uh, the, the printer wasn't leaking at that time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, you've got a deck and there, then there's a reader and you can load the deck into the reader. That's all that pretty much does. And then what you're going to do is step uh, through it. And as you step through it, you'll see like this instruction number one uh, tells the, the machine to read the next value from the reader and put it in the instruction that's addressed uh, by this. So the, the zero part of it, that character tells you what to do. And these two characters then tell you what memory address to do them to. And so that then writes the two from the reader into address number one. Um, you'll notice eventually that there's kind of a pattern here. So if, if you now look at this, this zero again means read something from the reader and put it into the address specified, right? So the 002 is telling you to read this next value from the reader and put it in 02. So you'll see that that happens. This is the imp or input op code, by the way. Um, and so what that did then is put an 800 in there. <clears throat> and what an 800 does is it skips back to the, uh, to the beginning. 
So you'll see this is basically a go-to, and it's going to set the PC. And you'll see that I'm, I'm animating the little diagram here. So the program counter and the instruction register are showing you what's going to happen. So you can see now that line just got bold, um, and the program counter has been set back to zero. So you know that that was a program counter set instruction. That goes back to the start again. And now you're going to see it's going to read in a 0, 1, 0. Um, and then that's going to cause the next in instruction to be read into memory address 10. And then it's going to jump back to the start again. And then it's going to read this 11 into this register. And then it's going to read the 605. So do you see that the pattern that's starting to form? 12. 13, 14, 15, 16, and then each one of those is a particular instruction. So the the, <clears throat> the way it works is the bootloader is a single instruction 001, which is always put into memory when the machine starts up. Then you load your program by specifying a read instruction at the address you actually want to write to, and then the instruction that you actually want to write into that value, and then the, the 800 was built <clears throat> by that uh, first cycle in order to go back and do it all over again. So um, basically, if you if you continue to step through it, it basically just is going to load in this program. And then at some point, the reader will be done. And you'll see that it loads in an O2. So now the next thing is going to go into this register too. And it's going to be a jump to address 10. And now we're actually running the program, which was loaded. Um, so then the, this, I won't bother going through the whole program here, but basically it's going to clear the accumulator, um, uh, and then it's going to, uh, oh, I've gone past one. Oh, it did a store, uh, to five. So it's basically, it's setting up these, these, uh, registers, um, with, uh, values and, uh, let's see what's it doing now. It, it, it basically it, what this is going to do is it's going to go through, and one of these address number four is the counter, which is counting down. The other one is the output, which is in number five. It's kind of an inefficient program using up two whole memory slots to do this, but it's uh, counting up to ten. And then when it's done, we'll see that it takes a jump. Uh, let's see, where is it? Right there. It takes a jump to um, uh, to the start again, which then just makes it stop because there's nothing in the reader. So it can't read, so it can't execute, so it stops at that point. So anyway, that's the, that's the little simulator. And again, what I really think is great about it is it points out that these instructions are all numerical, that you, know, you, you actually see numbers executing themselves as opposed to looking at just uh, machine language. And in, in the educational work that I've done, the key that I found is that there's two um, kind of limits. Like there's, a, there's a, a lot of instructional stuff available for assembly language, believe it or not. I mean, there's gob tons for C and JavaScript and other you know, even higher level languages. But there's, there's enough related to assembly language that you can learn that. And there's like NAND game, which is utterly fantastic for learning digital logic. Um, and it does a little bit on the whole like numerical execution part, but there's really very little that allows you to look at things uh, just in terms of numbers only and see how they execute. So that's why I thought this was valuable and wanted to, uh, you know, update it a little bit to make it a little bit more clear as to what was going on and also to make sure that it didn't disappear when some university person went through and decided to clear things out. Yeah, thanks, James. So th this kind of came about because James and I were talking about this at the beginning of the meeting. Um, if it's okay with you, James, I may drop a couple uh, the website, the web link and the uh, image I'm about to show into the presentation next month because we'll talk, we'll link it in that way. Um, is that okay with you, James? Oh, absolutely. Yes, please. I, I was actually very disappointed that more people didn't seem to react to it or want to use it. So I'm just overjoyed to have anybody have, show an interest. Yeah. So let, let me show you um, one thing that you don't capture with the website. I pulled up an image of this on uh, the web. Let me just show you what this thing actually looked like um, when it came out. 
because obviously this was way before the web. And where's my share screen? Wait, there was a time before the internet? I, yeah, and I think you and I actually lived it. <laughs> <laughs> that when the Encyclopedia Britannica was, was Wikipedia? <laughs> Uh -huh. Did you have the Encyclopedia Britannica at your house? We, we oh, thought yeah. we were fancy because we had it. Yep. And if uh, and if you wanted to know something else, you physically went to the library, went through the card catalog, and if they didn't have that in the library, then you could ask for an interlibrary loan and wait a yep. month for it to show up. Yep. And we and actually in King County, you could actually have them deliver it to in the to your house via the mail. Oh wow! Nice. Yeah, that was that was Skookum. <laughs> so anyway, what this th so what I'm showing here though is what this thing actually was when it was developed. And if you can, if I, I wish I could find one. Um, I I had one as a kid that got lost. It's, this is actually the first thing I learned to program on when my dad was taking a course. And it's one of the reasons I'm enthused about it because it is such a wonderful teaching aid. Um, but if you look at what this image is, it's essentially a, it's pieces of cardboard. And at, as you decode the opcode on the cardboard, you're sliding those little levers around. And what you're, what you're seeing is you can, there's little windows on there that are switching the, um, the various, you know, internal buses of the ALU, right? I have, I have yet today to see anything that teaches the basic principles as well as this device does it's it's you know it's simple it's to the point and it's it's as hands-on as you're ever going to get inside the processor and yeah it's just wonderful <laughs> so yeah thank, thanks for reminding me of that james <laughs> they actually have one at the computer history museum yeah and by the way they i, I don't know if anybody doesn't know this, but they actually have Shaky, the robot, at the Computer History Museum, which was the whole reason why I went there. Um, absolutely excellent. Um, and it's kind of weird because the way memory works, I was there years and years and years and years ago, uh, not long after they had first gotten Shaky. And for some reason, I thought Shaky was much larger than it actually was the first time that I saw it. So I was like, oh, it's a little bit smaller than I expected. And somehow or other, over the years, my brain kept revising Shaky yeah. to smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller sizes based on my initial reaction, right? So I went back this time and went, oh, my goodness, Shaky is huge. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was just a brilliant little example of how your brain screws you over. Uh, yeah, I had one of those when we did the. Um, for those of for those of you that came to the uh, Robo Magellan Plus event, uh, you know it was at an elementary school, right? Mm -hmm. And when Donna and I went to go, you know, scope the place out and figure out where we were going to put things, you know, we actually got a chance to walk through part of the elementary school. And uh, I haven't been in one of those for many decades, obviously. And the thing that amazed the heck out of me was how small the kid chairs were. Because the last time I was there, oh, the kid chairs, yes, chairs yes. for the kids, yeah. Because the last time I was there, I was a kid and I was small enough to fit in one, which is not the case now. <laughs> so okay, anyway, that's the cardiac. Um, does anybody have anything else they would like to share? If not, I got a couple of videos. Yeah. Does anybody want to see some pictures of Shaky from the trip to the Computer History Museum? Works for me. You've probably Go for already it. seen. you probably I, already I've seen. Yeah, I've seen Shaky, but uh, other people may not have. Go for it. Uh, so let's see. This is my favorite picture of Shaky here. Let me see if I can figure out how to share this again. Here, this one. Now that, my friends, is cable management. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is actually an improvement from the first time that I saw a shaky because this time he's actually on a um, turntable. 
so you know you can kind of get a, a sense of of uh, you know, like shaky from every angle. There's the <clears throat> discs, the disc antennas. I think the smaller one would be the video, and the bigger one would be the data. I'm assuming. <clears throat> oh no, I don't remember. Yeah, the other thing I thought was really interesting was this <clears throat> bit here tilts, but there's also a mirror. Uh, well, I'll get to that later. There's the pusher bar and the little switch that it activates. Actually, two different switches, one activated when it's out and the other one activated when it's in, which I hadn't realized before. And then these wire hoop sensors uh, with what look to be door springs, you know, the little door stopper things, mm -hmm. but like really long versions of it going back into this rubber grommet. I, I honestly don't know, but I'm assuming that the way these work is that when you push on this wire, it causes these to be pushed side to side. And that in yeah. the back, back here, there's a little contactor that triggers. I'd be really curious to hear if anybody else has any information about that. Um, same thing from the front. Uh, interesting how these kind of overlap. This, this one going off to the side and this one going off to the front and you can see as a blind spot right up there. Um, don't know what that was. Uh, really curious to know. There's so much I don't know about this robot, you know, just, just looking at it. Um, I'm assuming these are motor drivers down here. This mm -hmm. is the caster. Of course, the side wheels are the only ones that are driven. I'm not sure whether or not this rubber here i don't think that's connected to the sensor but one of the things i have seen is you use a rubber tube mounted around your robot and then you have a pressure sensor um so that when the tube gets hit you get a pressure pulse oops that's the northern bomb site where's my other here we go this is my video of shaky from all angles as it rotates on the turntable So yeah, you can see there's a motor actuator there that tips this whole assembly, but there's also a mirror in the top of this assembly that apparently redirects the camera to look in different places. And I have a dim memory of what that was about, but I don't remember <laughs> where the memory is from. So it's not accurate. I need to go back and review that to figure it out. Uh, but the other reason why I went to the museum is because <clears throat> I'm absolutely desperate to try and find the the, the code. Um, the only code that's really that I'm aware of is the code that was in the code excerpts that are in the papers that were published. You can see that mirror up there, by the way. Um, and and other than that, I don't know where the code went to. And given how unbelievably capable shaky was despite his rather obvious physical limitations um uh the, 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 this i mean you could type in commands like you know move block three from room four into room five and you know maybe shaky's in room one and he has to figure out how to get to you know room four in order to push the block and then it turns out that there is another block blocking the way and he has to push that block out of the way. And he doesn't know that at the beginning, right? So he has to, you know, encounter obstacles in the world and logically reason about how to, uh, you know, get around those uh, obstacles and, and figure out things. And that's just like, there's no hobby robot in the world that can do that, um, which really makes me kind of sad. Not sure what that guy is, but I thought he was cool. So I took a picture. Um, Sentry by Dinning Mobile Robotics, 1985. That's a fun one. Uh, interesting little robot arm there. Another interesting robot arm and a walker. And there's the cart. I mean, that's a piece of history right there. That's for sure. That's, that's the proto-Mars rover basically um, and uh, did you guys notice that the, the 
this huge undercarriage thing down here, apparently carrying the battery. I think that's what that is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, sling your mass low, uh, basically. Um, and the, the actuators uh, and the and the potentiometer, don't even see it right there. But, you know, a potentiometer to tell the system where the wheel actually is. That was a fun one. And the little um, light activated bot. I mean, I think this is, this isn't the original turtle bot, but I think those turtle bots were arguably the first actual robots that could, you know, react to their environment in some way. Um, I may be wrong about that, but I'm not aware of any earlier robots that actually were able to make decisions based on their uh, environment. And by decision, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> move forward when you see light in your environment. <laughs> uh, not a super fancy decision, but so oh, Cray. I think that was it. Well, yeah, and then of course yeah. you have to have a selfie with with Shaky. Right? <laughs> so I think that was it. I didn't take any other yeah, cool. pictures of it. Yeah, if you ever yeah. get a chance, if folks ever get a chance to go down to this computer history museum, it's uh, Mountain View, California. I think it's Mountain View, California. Yeah, it is. Um, it's yeah. I've been there. It's it, it's phenomenal. It's it's absolutely worth a trip to go see. Okay, so on that one, let's see. Does anybody have anything else they would like to share? We've got about 10, 15 minutes. Okay, I've got a couple of videos. <clears throat> so, um, essentially what I'll do, the first one we'll just compare and contrast with um, James' tour through the past here. We will jump to uh, Elon Musk and the, um, the current, it's a little blurb update on uh, the, uh, the Tesla robot. Get this guy queued up here. And let's see, full screen. Let me get past the advertisement. Okay, let me share this real quick. Let's see. Share sound, optimize for video, share screen three. There we go. Okay, can people generally see that? Can't hear it. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of weird seeing the arms and legs just separate. We have a whole lab full of arms and legs. This is Elon Musk speaking. Bearing in mind that uh, when we did AI Day, uh, this version of Optimus didn't work, work at all. So the rate of improvement here, I think, is, is quite uh, significant. Um, it's obviously not doing parkour, uh, but uh, it is walking around. And we have multiple, multiple uh, copies, I suppose, of Optimus. Um, The thing that I think Tesla brings to the table that others don't have is that we have um, we have the uh, real world AI. We're, we're the most advanced in real world AI. So the same AI that drives the car, uh, it, which you can think of the car really as a robot on wheels, and this is a robot on legs. Um, so, as we solve real-world AI, and I don't think there's any—I don't think there's anyone even close to Tesla on solving real-world AI. Um, that same computer and software uh, goes into Optimus. Um, so it's it's not that helpful to have a humanoid robot if you have to program every individual action. Um, it needs to be able to walk around autonomously and solve tasks. 
Um, you should be able to instruct it in simple things by sh showing visually what, you, what, what the robot needs to do or just telling it what to do. So, um, so I think that's a key advantage that we have. And then we also uh, are good at designing things for manufacturing and then manufacturing itself. So the, the actuators in Optimus are all custom designed Tesla actuators. So we designed the, the, the electric motor, the gearbox, the power electronics, obviously the battery pack, and everything else that goes into Optimus. Um, we're actually quite, we were quite surprised to find how little was available off the shelf. Uh, because there's a lot of, a vast number of electric motors, um, gearboxes and whatnot, that are available in the world. And we found none of them were useful in a, in a humanoid robot, literally none. So you have to custom design the actuators um, for a humanoid robot. Um, and so the same team that designed the groundbreaking uh, electric motors that are in the, say, the Model S Plaid designed the actuators in the robot. Um, so, I mean, for, for practical purposes, what this means is that we should be able to bring an actual product to market at scale that is useful um, far faster than any, anyone else. Um, and, you know, assuming that the things I'm saying are true, uh, or at least you can put it, I think they are true, and just, it's just a question of the timing, um, you start getting into interesting questions of like, what's the ratio of humans to humanoid robots? I think it might be greater than one to one. You know, because you could, you could sort of see a use, a home use for robots, certainly industrial uses for robots, uh, humanoid robots. Um, I, think, I think we might exceed a one to one ratio of humanoid robots to humans. Um, it's not even clear what an economy means at that point, you know, since an economy is output per person times persons, but if output is much higher and there's no limit on persons, then what's the actual limit on the economy, you know? Well, we're still pretty far from Kardashev Kart scales here, but uh, we're getting there. So anyway, uh, it's a, probably the least understood or appreciated part of what we're doing at Tesla, but will probably be worth significantly more than the, uh, the car side of things long term. So, Charlie. Okay, so there was that one. Um, I've got one more we can do real quick if people are interested. So I'm, I'm just kind of curious if anybody has any thoughts on how much of that was scripted and how much of that is real. I, I, no, I think all, I think what we were seeing from the robot, probably all of it was scripted. Um, my, I, I don't have any illusion the robot was actually doing any of that autonomously. I, I think the takeaway, at least in my mind, is the robot was standing, it was walking, and it, you know, it seemed to have some ability to put parts in the correct places, although, you know, which, which you know, from as, as uh, he mentioned, you know, that was a big step up from the last time you saw the robot. I don't think it was actually building the robot by itself yet. <laughs> I think that was. But, but it's uh, interesting that he's tapping into that whole thing as a as like marketing. Like that's yeah. At the point where you get robots building robots, when it, when a individual robot can build a copy of itself, even if it has to use other machines to do it, that's that's where everything really explodes, right? And exactly. He's, yep. He's kind of he's he's working in that direction and he's promising that and and one of those things is good and the other one is bad. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see what happens. Yeah, the part I thought was interesting because I've, I've, you know, <clears throat> I've done this math in my head a few times. Uh, you know, once you get robots building robots, you know, what's the what's the growth rate? And uh, yeah, it goes exponential and uh, exceeds human you know, number of humans really, really quick. So long as you keep feeding it resources, right? It's uh, I don't know if people have looked at the you know the, the paperclip problem. It's an it's a AI thought experiment. You know, you tell an AI to 
you know, make as many paper clips as it can, and the AI goes wacky and you know turns the whole world into paper clips. And <clears throat> you know, that's kind of the uh, the hyped, you know, scary version. Uh, the reality is, you just stop giving it raw materials and you stop making paper clips. You know. <laughs> And you're going to run into the same thing here. It's like you, you stop giving the robots raw materials to make robots, and guess what? They're you know going to stop making robots, or they're going to go start mining raw materials themselves. But um, yeah, it, it's an interesting um, it's an interesting paradigm that we're we're diving into headlong. <laughs> uh, let's see. So. See how long this next clip is here, real quick, and we'll see if we can do this, this one. This is all three minute clip, folks. What, you guys, good for one more? Yay, nay, has everybody ran off already? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, we'll do one more and then we'll do, do our break. Current robotics pipelines require a specialized robotics engineer writing code specific to each task or platform. Our goal is to use ChatGPT and have even non-technical users be able to work with robots, primarily by interacting with the model through natural language instructions, and solving a variety of tasks like using a robot arm to arrange blocks, using a drone to inspect a shelf, or finding and navigating to objects using a robot equipped with computer vision capabilities. LLMs show emergent and interesting capabilities with sufficient prompt engineering. ChatGPT is a unique model because it combines the best of text generation, conversationality, and code generation. Robotic systems, unlike text-only applications, require a deep understanding of the real-world physics, environmental context, and the ability to perform physical actions. A generative robotics model needs to have a robust common-sense knowledge and a sophisticated world model. Ideally, it would interact with users to interpret and execute commands in ways that are physically possible and are appropriate in the real world. To make effective use of ChatGPT for robotics, we follow a series of design principles and define a high-level function library instead of asking it to generate code unique to each robot or API. ChatGPT gets to be the logical and creative problem-solving element, building upon its rich knowledge base, whereas low-level execution is handled by the back-end library implementation. This way, we can try to realize the vision of a co-pilot for robotics, one that can adapt to different form factors and simulators, while allowing users to almost talk to their robots and get them to achieve desired behavior. We architect this pipeline such that a roboticist on the loop can help ensure code correctness and safety, instead of relying naively on the outputs of ChatGPT. Alternatively, we also show how ChatGPT can interface with a simulator to allow for risk-free deployment and analysis. Coupled with this high-level tooling, ChatGPT solves manipulation, drone navigation, and several other tasks in a zero-shot fashion. It can also generate code for complex scenarios through conversations. This is an example of a user working with ChatGPT to generate code for a drone inspection scenario. The user can simply point out desired features through casual conversation, and ChatGPT makes necessary edits to the code. And finally, ChatGPT is able to effectively leverage both perception and action APIs to close the loop. Okay. Most people have no clue that in 2023, the wow. best way. Um, do you have, can you post a link to that uh, video, Lloyd? I'd like to look into that one. Oh, let's see. Yeah, hang on a sec. Let me. Oops. Let's see. The, the, the part of that that's really interesting to me is uh, that, you know, getting the code and using that to move the robot for some strange reason. I didn't, I didn't think of that. And I've been wondering. Yeah. Like how do you, how do you, you know, lock a robot into ChatGPT's responses? And I guess the answer is, just let ChatGPT write the code. 
Yeah, so there's, I'm just starting to get into this. Um, for folks that are in the um, Seattle area, I actually bumbled into a um, Big Data Bellevue user group over the week. And uh, if you look that up, um, they actually have a talk on some of the LLMs uh, that was given this week. Uh, basically, there's an, what, what I'm gathering they do is they generate an API and the LLM generates a call by some mechanism I'm not fully adversed on yet. But the, the LLM actually generates a call into this dedicated API, and that carries out the action or the lookup or whatever that API does. So it's like um, Google's AI, for instance, they're talking about it being able to you know, order airline tickets for you and do things like that. And you can, you can imagine that's... Um, Basically, you know, just a login to a, a REST type API, you know, here's all the information here. You log into your session and so forth. And it's, you know, the LLM would just um, generate those calls and then it would be carried out just like you do now on a, a conventional um, interface. So I think that's what's going on. And I, um, there may be more complexity I'm not aware of. So anyway, I put the links to both videos in the chat. So we'll, we've got those captured. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead, let's do a 10 minute break. And uh, so we'll be back at 11.05. And uh, Michael, I think I saw you online. Are you here? Yes, I am. Okay, let's take this time and get you all set up. We'll Great. Be ready to go. We'll be ready to go for your presentation at 11.05. Hi, how you doing, by the way? <laughs> doing well. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, no, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, definitely. Okay, let's see. Um, so I just, I have it in a PowerPoint. Uh, I'll pull that up and just okay. try and share screen. Yeah, go uh, ahead and just share screen and we'll see what we've got there. Great. Share the whole screen. Um, okay. So um, what I'm seeing is your actual, there we go. That's got it. Yep, better. that looks good. Perfect. Kind of a weird, maybe it's just me. There's a couple of, Couple of patches. I'm not sure if it's part of your image. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh you know what other, it was. These are other windows that are overlapping. The yeah, that was. I had all you guys' faces uh, up on the ah, side. Ah, so okay. Yep, I'll, I'll move you as far and out of the way as possible. And uh, okay. So. Yeah, because to us that actually shows up as just a um, a striped block. Gotcha. So there's the one your mouse is over, and then there's one at the top center of the screen. Let me see if I can hide that. Hide video panel. Hide flip. Uh, okay. Uh, let's try it this way. Um, and now uh, I've got one. Oh, there we go. Perfect. That's got it. Whatever you're doing right now is great. Good. So the one thing I was going to say too, uh, I don't know how you guys usually do this. I'm I'm totally happy to take questions throughout. Um, but for me to have it this way, I don't have anyone's uh, face on the screen. Um, and so you'll just have to like you know pipe up and interrupt me. Uh, which yeah. Is totally I'm in my mind, it's kind of up to you, however you, you would like to do it. We've got a small enough group here yeah. that I think if, if somebody wants to ask a question, you know, just unmute and ask. If, yeah, if, that if you're be, comfortable I, with that. I'm totally good with that. I encourage you to jump in. And you'll just have, again, be assertive because uh, I'll get moving uh, and uh, I can't see you. So, um, but I'm, I'm really happy to do questions throughout or and or at the end, either way. Okay. That, that works for me. Um, yeah. So let's do this. Um, if we're all set, I'm going to start a timer for like nine minutes. Great. And then we'll give people to, you know, enough time to do a little bio break or grab a snack or whatever. And then we will come back and it's all yours. Great. And I just have to find out where I put my timer. <laughs> that is. Okay. Let's see. And if you, um, Michael, if you could stop sharing, I will start sharing. Great. We'll actually go for eight minutes. Okay. And folks, you'll feel free to keep chatting or something. I'm going to take a quick little breather and uh, I'll be back hopefully in three or four minutes before the, the timer gets too far ahead. I'm not sure if the timer shared.
Yep, yep, that's, I'm just getting there. Okay, how's that? Can we see the timer? Great. Okay, I'll be back momentarily. Okay, I'm back. So, so is the cat. So uh, <clears throat> I was kind of disappointed that nobody else uh, shared anything, especially about like 
their current rope on the work on the robots or something. I, I, I feel like I've, I haven't had my fix of checking in on people's progress on their. <clears throat> yeah, we're going we're gonna to have to drive that a little bit more. It's uh, the last couple of meetings that it's kind of come way comes and goes a bit. I, I get, but yeah, it's, uh, I, I guess there is a big robotics competition coming up. So people aren't, uh, people are catching up on their yard work or something. Yeah, that could be it. We just had one, um, what was it, August, September? September, we had one. So people have been working on their bots kind of through the summer and stuff. So um, the Robothon group is meeting tomorrow evening. And part of that is we're going to come up with the competitions for next year. We're going to figure out what we're doing uh, 2024. So uh, that hopefully will spur people to get back going on it. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, we gotta we gotta motivate people to build stuff. That's one thing that we've talked about as a as a group a few times. Is to, you know how do we get people in the group building more robotics? So. All righty, got about a minute twenty left. You still there, Michael? Oh, we lost him too. Okay. Yeah, yes, I am. No, you're good. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I uh, I ran away for a minute, but I am around. No worries. I think everybody ran away this time. It's, it's kind of interesting. Some of these, you know, breaks. Sometimes people are really, really chatty during the breaks, and sometimes they're not. This this is a quiet group today, so. <laughs> oh, good. So, I thought the um uh pictures from the uh uh computer museum i'm blanking on the, the full name uh but of uh of kind of some some old school robots were really fun um yeah uh a couple of those like turtle in particular has come you know wh when you're trying to build a tiny robot one of the things that'll come through in my talk is um uh you know <laughs> excuse me like macro scale robots have a lot of capabilities and the stuff that you're showing from you know tesla or boston dynamics right. all those guys it's like absolutely incredible and uh Tiny robots are kind of a throwback because you're really starting from the ground up again. So it's like you go back to some of those and there's inspiration for the sort of stuff that I'm doing. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, I'm going to kill the timer here because we're down to six seconds. We don't need it to go off. We already know it's there. All righty. Stop sharing. Okay, welcome back, folks. And uh, yep. This is Michael Franklin Reynolds, and he's going to be presenting on microbotics, nanobotics, etc. So uh, with that, I'll just turn it over to you. Go for it. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for uh, for having me. Um, this is uh, really fun. Uh, um, let me make sure that I can get my. Um, we'll get the. Uh... Yeah, we're still seeing we're still seeing a couple of windows overlapping. Good. Did that do it? Uh, one is dead center. So, oh, there it goes. It's gone. Okay, you're good. Okay, a little delay on the screen, but that's all good. Um, uh, yeah, so what I'm going to talk with you about today, the title of my talk is Microscopic Robots with CMOS Electronics. Uh, and I'll spend a little bit of time kind of motivating that and talking through what I mean and what the work is. But that's what you're looking at on the right is um, uh, a chip that I work on. Uh, these are the ones, uh, my, my robots after building them, but before releasing them. Um, I'm currently a, uh, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Pennsylvania, actually. So I was at Cornell uh, and I switched over and I'm working in the group of Mark Miskin, who actually was at Cornell with me for a little bit. So we were buddies there. Uh, and now I'm uh, uh, I'm joined up with him for, for more tiny robot work. Um, uh, before that, like I said, I was at Cornell. I uh, worked in uh, Paul McEwen's group uh, during graduate school. Uh, and then uh, I did a short postdoc with uh, Nicholas Abbott uh, over here uh, in chemical and biomolecular engineering. Uh, and so um, I'll talk a little bit about the work, uh, if I have time at the end, a little bit about the work that I'm doing in my postdocs. But the bulk of what I want to talk to you guys about today uh, is some work that I did uh, kind of to wrap up my PhD um, uh, on uh, these microscopic robots. And it came out in 2022. So it's uh, um, uh, a little bit old at this point, but uh, um, but still you know new enough to, to be fun and relevant. Uh, and in doing that, I'll talk about some um, uh, some of the work that, that kind of built up to, to this paper. Um, and then, uh, like I said, at the end, if there's time, I'll also chat through some of the more recent stuff and where we're at and where we're going. Um, okay, so let me let me motivate this work um, for a minute. Um, like you guys probably know, um, uh, 
you know, if you take a, a little drop of pond water and you put it under a microscope, you find all sorts of uh, cool and incredible creatures uh, at size scales, you know, from, a, you know, a, le a micron or less than a micron up to a, a couple hundred uh, microns that are sort of at this, this microscopic size scale. You have to look at them under a microscope to be able to resolve what they are and what they're doing. And I've, I've uh, pulled a few of my favorite ones uh, on this screen. So on the left, uh, at about 30 microns in size, you have green algae. So uh, these guys are capable of, of moving around. They have flagella and they're also phototactic, uh, kind of like turtle. Uh, they, they know how to seek the light. That's their, their food. And so they, they hunt that down. Um, and then uh, if you go up in size a little bit, uh, the, the bottom one, that's a scanning electron micrograph of a paramecium. Uh, so all those tiny little hairs are cilia. That's how it moves around. Uh, and this guy's capable of hunting its own prey. So it, it eats some of the smaller organisms like, like the ones on the left. And then up in size even a little bit more, around 500 microns is a tardigrade or a water bear. Uh, these things are all sorts of incredible. So you can see it has like, you know, a bunch of little clawed feet uh, and, you know, they, they move around on all sorts of surfaces and uh, are even capable of, of putting themselves to, into hibernation. So these guys can survive in space. If you, you know, float them up, they, uh, you know, they're not up and moving, but, you know, you, you rehydrate them and, and they're good to go. So this sort of like incredible litany of, um, of uh, tiny biological organisms. Uh, that, that point out basically that you could have, you know, moving parts and pieces and things that have all sorts of sensing and interacting and all these sort of things at a really small size scale. Um, and uh, these sort of things, and this was probably my introduction to uh, micro robotics, also show up in all sorts of fiction. Um, uh, and so, you know, a number of, of novels here that, that um, uh, include this, including one actually, um, I'm, you know, Paul doesn't pay me to do this, but my advisor actually wrote a, uh, a novel um, that features a, a tiny robot. So I think he he wrote this, had been excited about tiny robots, and was like, "No, actually, we're gonna we're gonna go try and do that." Uh, and so that was the uh, the the sci-fi motivation for uh, for the lab that I was in getting into this field. Uh, and you know, they've taken over cinema as well. Um, I got introduced to them at a tiny, at a very young age, with a you know a magic school bus version. But Marvel and Star Trek, all these guys have, have you know taken over. And so you know, these guys, the the, the robots envisioned here are, are man-made versions, really, of the sort of things that you see in nature. But it raises a question, which is, are there any real microscopic robots. Uh, can anyone build anything, you know, probably not yet achieving the complexity of the sort of things that are envisioned in sci-fi, but like what, what exists that's man-made that you can, you can, you know, uh, move and steer around and, and do at this scale. So are there any real ones? And the answer is yes, sort of, um, or at least it was as of, uh, as of a couple of years ago. Uh, so there's a bunch of really cool, um, work in microscopic robotics, uh, but to, to at risk of oversimplifying a little bit, I would say that it overall falls into um, a couple of categories. One of them is active matter. So these are things where you put like a little particle into a fuel and it's able to move itself around. So you get a little bubble rocket there on the left or uh, the one uh, bottom left is a, a little phototactic, light driven phototactic swimmer. So you turn the lights on and it goes and you turn them off and it stays. And so these things move autonomously, but they're, they're really pretty simple in their functions. Um, and then on the right, you get some things where you can control them externally, you know, either by the, the one on top that has magnets on board. And so it's a flapping bird that you're, you know, uh, articulating magnetically. And the one on the bottom uh, basically can generate these wave patterns because it's a, a, a polymer that swells in response to light. And so these things, you can get some complex motions, but they have to be externally controlled. Uh, and so to, to, you know, oversimplify further, what I would say is you had maybe robots of some sort, something that kind of looks like a robot, but certainly not smart robots. They didn't have uh, any sort of um, uh, ability to really compute on board. Um, uh, and so that was the thing that, that we wanted to go after was to build a, uh, um, a smart microscopic robot. Uh, and so our, our, you know, kind of first pass at this, one of them uh, is shown uh, here on the left. Uh, and what I'm gonna do uh, in a bunch of this talk is talk you through the pieces of this guy and then basically, you know, how we, uh, how we deploy them and, uh, and you know, what, what this first graph could do uh, and then kind of talk about where, where this um, field of tiny smart robots is going from here. So the parts of this robot, um, uh, for a robot to, to move around, it has to have some sort of an actuator. So here I've just labeled them legs, uh, but um, uh, the, the little things off to the, the sides, it has to have some, something to power it. Uh, and so, you know, that lives on the, the little, you know, center body uh, up on the top part. Uh, and then it has what I'll colloquially call a brain, but this one, it's an onboard integrated circuit. Um, uh, and then you have to be able to put all those pieces together in a single package and release them and, and get them to, to walk off on their own. Um, uh, and so I'll, I'll just run through these things, kind of the, what, what the pieces are, and then put them all together. Um, 
Uh, so the legs of the robot, one of the challenges um, we realized when we got to this field, and particularly um, uh, if you want to um, uh, have a robot that can be controlled by an onboard circuit, is that you need a leg that responds to voltages. And there really, there were like a couple of those, but they each had some issues. And so one of the first challenges was actually uh, to develop the leg for this robot. And so this is some work uh, that happened at uh, Cornell uh, while I was a graduate student. Uh, it was led by Mark, who's the professor who I'm now, now working with, uh, but a bunch of people were involved with it. Uh, and we developed something uh, that we called a surface electrochemical actuator uh, or a C. Um, and uh, these are, uh, the, the way that these, these Cs work, so you can see, let me play the video again. Um, uh, this is one of those Cs bending and unbending as we apply voltages to it. They live underwater, so they live in solution. And the way that this guy's being driven is that basically the, the big black thing that you see over here is a metal probe that we have in the fluid uh, that is attached to our little actuator. And we're applying voltages to that thing versus some uh, uh, counter electrode not pictured in the solution. Uh, and if you could basically look at the C, you know, take a tiny cross section, what you'd actually see is that it's made up of a couple of layers. So the, the active layers on this thing, there's a, a capping layer of titanium, that's a passive layer, uh, but then an active layer of platinum, and that's the thing that actually causes the bending. Uh, the way that it works is that platinum, basically when you uh, apply voltages to it in uh, aqueous electrolytes, um, adsorbs ions on its surface. So if you go negative, you can absorb hydrogen. If you go positive, you can absorb oxygen or other oxygen um, uh, oxidizing species. Uh, and uh, these uh, ions, when they adsorb on that surface, generate a tiny surface stress at that surface. Now, if you have a, a bulk piece of platinum, a big piece, uh, that you don't even notice that, nothing happens. But as you make that platinum thinner and thinner and thinner to the nanoscale, uh, you basically can start to drive bending by this adsorption on one side of your actuator. Uh, and so that's that's what we built. This whole thing is about 10 nanometers thick. Uh, and the uh, basically the adsorption of ions generates the bending uh, of this tiny actuator. Um, and so that's the legs uh, of this of the tiny robot. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll make one other point, which is made by this video, uh, which is that you can address them. So here, you know, I'm you know actuating a couple of legs in and out of phase, and you know you can play fun games like pumping fluid, but that's going to basically allow us to set up gates and allow this thing to walk. Um, great. So okay, that's legs. Um, uh, the next bit is power. Um, and uh, you know, powering a robot, there are lots of of good options, and we chose one of the common ones. It turns out that for a tiny robot, one of the first things that you might think is like, let's just slap a battery on that. Um, but that turns out to be a, a tough idea for a couple of reasons. Um, the, the biggest one being that as you shrink things down uh, to small sizes, batteries power scale volumetrically. And so basically you can work it out to power these legs, you get something like a thousand cycles or less uh, out of your your uh, you know your be world's best battery. And so we did something else that could be powered con continuously, which was to just add a tiny solar cell. So basically, this is going to be a, um, a light-powered robot uh, that, that we're building here. Um, and uh, before we got to putting a circuit on board, uh, basically, Mark took those first two components and built a tiny robot that could walk. So that's a video uh, of this guy. Again, its legs are those surface electrochemical actuators. And then the little um, uh, blocks that you see here are the little photovoltaics. Uh, and what he's doing, you can see this white dot. He's basically rastering, clicking a laser back and forth uh, to shine on the, the photovoltaics and power this thing uh, and cause it to move. Um, so that's great. Uh, that's most of the pieces that you need. Uh, but now to make a, a little autonomous, a little smart robot, what it really needs is that that final piece, that circuit. Um, and again, here, like I've alluded to, we're, we're not gonna um, we're not gonna go from scratch. We're gonna steal. So uh, basically, there's a whole industry, uh, as you guys are well aware of in Seattle, of building um, you know tiny tiny circuit components. Uh, and in fact, what we did is that we worked with a, um, a foundry uh, called XFAB, uh, basically uh, worked with a group of electrical engineers at Cornell, uh, headed by uh, Al Molnar here, uh, to design circuits, uh, and then got them taped out and shipped back to us. Uh, and that was going to make up the brain of the robot. So basically, once you, you, know, you, you do this, you send them your circuit designs, you send them a bunch of money, you uh, wait for three months, um, and then uh, back in the mail, uh, they send you these beautiful uh, you know, six-inch wafers. Uh, that uh, have um, uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch of circuits on board, and so in fact, if you zoom in on these guys, uh, you can see these are the, the little circuits that we're going to build our robots robots around. Um, and uh, if I zoom in even further, uh, 
can kind of break down the parts of this circuit. So you have the photovoltaics for power. There's a big set of photovoltaics that are for powering the legs and then a little set down here that are gonna power our tiny circuit. Uh, and then uh, our little CMOS circuit uh, brain uh, for the robot. And the first ones that we built are really, really simple. Um, so dead simple, all the brain is designed to do um, is deliver a series of phase shifted square waves uh, at um, a sufficient voltage to drive the actuators. So basically my circuit designer gave me uh, eight output states uh, and you essentially set the gate of this robot by wiring the leg to the appropriate output state to, to set up uh, the, the gate for the robot to walk. And he also gave me a nice little option at the bottom uh, to tune frequency if I wanted to. Um, so that's it. We called this guy Clockbot because it really is basically just some, uh, this, this circuit is sort of a, a glorified clock. Um, okay. Can I ask a quick question about that? Yeah, absolutely. You, you said something about tuning. How, how would that actually, how would you actually change this in order to tune it? Uh, yeah, so okay, I, I probably, the, the tuning, um, the on this version at least, the frequency is hardwired in. Uh, so tuning is maybe the wrong word, but basically selecting maybe would be. Uh, uh, oh, okay. So this is something like if you if you remade the silicon, it would be very easy to just change it to another setting. Yeah, and well, it's it's even a little bit yeah a little subtly different than that. So basically, I'll show this in a minute. But the way that I'm going to make these guys is to build a ton of them in parallel. Um, and so essentially, you you get this circuit, and then what I get to choose to do is which of these states do I want to wire up to. Uh, and then which of the frequencies do I want to, you know, basically the, the option is you connect this pin to this bar and that sets the frequency. And so you essentially pick your pin, wire it to your bar, and that sets the uh, um, the frequency. But, but this is wiring that's happening. Oh, oh, wait a minute. So are you saying that every one of those little brains on that silicon uh, die is a different set of options? Is that the, the thing? Uh, it's It's the same circuit but you can choose a different set of options on each individual circuit. Right, but but those, so what I'm saying is you choose that before it's put onto the silicon. It's not like, there's no way to go in there and change it after it's been burned. Mm -hmm. the so that's that's the other trick. Basically, I'm gonna do a lot of post-processing on this chip. Uh, oh, wow. So I'm choosing it in post-processing, basically. Uh, so I take this chip and then I'm, what I'll show you here in just a second is fabricating all the legs and other pieces, parts and pieces of it around it. Part of that fabrication is to go in, basically touch down to these, you know, connect to these pins and wire them up to the things I want, including- Oh, the with the bond system. out wires. Okay, yeah, I'll just good. shut up now and let you get on with it. Thank no, you. No, 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 it's a great question and I appreciate you clarifying. Uh, let me pause here for two, any other questions? Uh, I've blown through, you know, a, a chunk kind of quickly, but uh, happy to, to answer anything else. Okay, we'll keep plugging then. Uh, again, I, re I really appreciate it and keep stopping me if there are other things. Um, uh, great. So now, uh, my job really was go build this thing. Um, uh, and I'm going to show you that happening first in a blender animation, uh, because there it is easy and simple and perhaps easier to understand. So, uh, essentially, um, the way that you do this, you start with your circuit and I'm going to etch down and make contacts to those top parts. Like I talked about, etch out the body of the robot, put down wiring, shield the circuit from light. Uh, and then put down the legs and un ultimately undercut the wafer out from underneath the robot uh, and release this thing so that hopefully if everything works, it's allowed to just walk off all by itself. Um, so uh, that's the fab process, the uh, the easy version of it. Um, what I'm going to show you here then is a video. It's sort of my favorite and least favorite video in this talk. Basically, it is a, um, a time-lapse set of images of building these tiny robots uh, of all the fab steps that I do. Uh, it's my favorite because it sort of lets you see all the process. And it's my least favorite because it reduces 250 plus clean room hours uh, for me to you know the span of about 20 seconds. So there you go. Um, but again, basically what you're doing, you start with the circuit, you etch down and wire up those contacts, you etch out the body of the robot, uh, and then you re-encapsulate everything, put down your wires, shield that circuit from light, uh, and then make panels for the legs, deposit the actuators, um, and ultimately you have this completed little robot uh, that's ready for release. Um, uh, and so then you just have to release it. Uh, the way that that works, I put down uh, a little shielding layer over the top. So basically it's aluminum everywhere and then uh, little holes down back to the silicon. And then there's a tool basically that etches really selectively to silicon. Uh, and so you undercut why it's gotten all wrinkly is all the regions where you just had that aluminum 
now our uh, the silicon underneath it is completely undercut out from from underneath it, uh, and so these robots are ready to be released. And so this video uh, is showing me I, I basically put that little chip with my little chip with my robots on it into uh, an, a petri dish with aluminum etching. Uh, and so uh, as the aluminum etches, you get this little rain of tiny robots down to the bottom of the Petri dish. And there's some tiny robots. So there, there they are. Um, uh, and uh, here's a bunch of them just uh, in a transmission image, but a bunch, you release a, a bunch of these guys all, all in parallel. Um, uh, and so now I wanna talk to you about um, uh, a couple of the robots that we built. Um, uh, the first one uh, was, uh, it's a really simple one. Uh, basically, it's just a robot. So, you know, you have your uh, your central body here and then your legs, it's basically a rigid panel here uh, and the bending hinge here. And, you know, the same thing on this side, uh, hinge bending and uh, rigid panel. Uh, and it's a super simple robot uh, that basically is designed to just bend those legs, uh, you know, uh, alternately. So you get this little phase delay. Um, uh, I'll, I'll jump to a brief aside here. It was actually inspired. There's a really cool paper kind of on uh, microorganisms and bridging a little bit into micro robots um, uh, by um, uh, a physicist named Purcell that was published in like 76 or 77 called Life at Low Reynolds Number. And one of the things that he proposed was essentially a thing that swims by doing this motion. So ours is a, it's a rock, it's silicon, so it sinks. Uh, but we kind of still got inspired by it. His claim is that it's sort of like the, one of the simplest possible things you could imagine that would swim. And so we um, we designed this little walking robot. And in honor of him, we call this guy Purcellbot. Um, uh, but the thing about Purcellbot, in his in his paper, he gives you some idea of how, how it's supposed to move if it swims. Uh, going into this, we, we really didn't know um, uh, how it was going to move uh, when we released it. Uh, and so... Uh, I did what any good experimentalist would do, I guess, uh, which is found a, a little, my little macro scale model for it, a very recognizable uh, set of toys here, um, uh, and just built a model. This was actually, we we uh, we designed the circuits and I was designing the robots during COVID lockdown. And so my advisor let me buy um, uh, a set of Legos to, to um, build some some really simple prototype macro scale robots for uh, our, you know, to analog for the micro scale. Um, so, but this is my, uh, this is my audience participation. My one audience participation part of my talk uh, is do you guys, and let me see if I can find, uh, I'm gonna bring back the blurry boxes for a second, uh, just so that I can see everyone. Uh, guesses on uh, which way, uh, if, if you set this thing up and you have it do this alternating pattern of, you know, bend the you know, right leg, then left leg, then right leg, then ref, left leg, um, uh, which way does it walk or does it not walk at all? Um, so I'll give you guys a, a second to think. I, I'm going to guess that it depends on the size of the robot and the medium that it's in, mm. because there's a lot of interaction between the legs and the surface. On the wrong surface, it won't walk at all. But on so the what? right surface, I would guess that it's going to walk to the right. Mm. Nice set of guesses there. Does anyone else have, have guesses or opinions? All right, well, we'll just go with it. So James is, is pretty much on the money. Um, uh, let me just show you my, uh, let me hide all of these again first. Um, um, so uh, this is uh, my, my tiny robot analog. Uh, and my dog, Charlie. Uh, so once you've gotten done noticing how uh, surprised and terrified Charlie is of this robot, you can see that James James is 100% right. Uh, even on this slippery table, uh, it walks uh, to the right or functionally following the, the leading phase leg. Um, and there's actually a sort of simple way that you can tell why that might happen. It basically has to do with the center of mass of the robot with respect to the leg position. So basically, if you do a you know a balance of torques and forces, um, the uh, when the um, uh, leading leg, let's say they're both underneath the bot, bot first, you know, do this awkwardly. Uh, when the leading leg bends out, um, it moves farther away from the center of mass, and so it's easier for that leg to slip. And then the uh, back leg now is close to the center of mass, where the whole duration of its motion pushes it forward. And then you get the same basically as the leading leg moves back in, it pulls the robot forward. 
And then the back leg is allowed to slip because it's further away from that center of mass. And so even this like kind of stupidly simple, really basic, don't know how to make my robot balance on its legs design, uh, in principle gets you a thing that's allowed to walk off all by itself. Uh, and in practice, uh, after a little bit of troubleshooting of that fabrication, when you release these guys, you can see the tiny robot just powered by light. All I'm doing is looking at this under the microscope and the light that you're seeing shine on it is also powering it. And you see it start to walk uh, in much the same way, kind of slipping and sliding, but moving itself um, along that surface. And there was screaming and shouting in the lab. I was very happy. I can't, and you know, as is usually the case, you know, uh, I was alone in the lab, so no one got to witness that. But then I ran and screamed and got all my lab mates and, and dragged them in to, to force them to watch this thing flail its way along the surface. Um, uh, so, okay, that's super fun and sort of this like, you know, really, really simple version of the robot. You can also build things that are significantly more complex. Uh, this one uh, is a little six-legged robot. Um, each leg has a couple of hinges on it. Uh, and we call it Antbot for obvious reasons. And it's designed to walk with a, an alternating tripod gate uh, similar to how an ant walks. So uh, maybe this is all very familiar. Uh, you know, to everyone, but, it, you know, it was sort of, you know, fun for me to go figure some of these things out. But basically, as an ant walks, it simultaneously moves the um, uh, middle leg on one side and the top and bottom leg on the other. And so basically, you get these two tripods, middle on one side and top and bottom on the other, that alternate uh, and allow it to basically have a stable base the whole time while still moving itself forward. Uh, so alternating tripod gate, super common one, probably if you guys have built uh, you know, model legged robots, this is one of the first things that you jump to. And similarly for us, as we're building our, our tiny robots, it was one of the first things that we jumped to. Um, and so here is uh, Antbot scooting its way along the surface uh, in real time as well. Um, you can see that uh, there's all sorts of debris that it's, uh, it's scooting along with it. Um, this guy's a chunk faster. Basically, it doesn't have to slip and slide. It's allowed to move. Uh, and so I watched this guy walk for probably 15, 20 minutes just uh, you know, scooting along um, a glass cover slide. Add a little bit of an angle to the legs so that garbage is pushed out of its way instead of being drug along. It's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think um, uh, it depends on if you want a, a Roomba or not, I guess. But um, probably that would be a, a better uh, better choice is to, to shuffle it away. Um, uh, the last robot that we build actually um, has a, um, a little uh, tiny circuit, uh, a, diff a different tiny circuit for it. Um, that starts to add in a, a little bit of programmability. Uh, so basically this one, instead of just having, um, it has all the same parts as before, but now it also has a little optical receiver. Uh, and basically the idea was that if you uh, blink in a command with your big light source externally, you can shift the behavior of the robot. And so now you get something that starts to have that little bit of tunability where basically you can, you know, have the robot walking at one frequency, say, and then blink in your command and tell it to speed up. Uh, and so this is the, you know, the robot, the, the circuit, just testing that circuit, um, you know, working on chip. Um, uh, and we, you know, for, again, we, apparently we just love cute names. I don't know what to tell you, but we called this one Dogbot because it can take very simple commands. Uh, and so uh, here's Dogbot working in real time. You can see it start off with a, a slow gate. And then at some point here, I will blink in uh, my, my command to speed it up and it scoots itself along uh, at a gate that's twice as fast. Um, and so that was sort of the initial demonstration, this kind of little set of robots uh, for, uh, you know, microscopic robots with um, onboard uh, CMOS electronics. Um, it obviously is, you know, on the one hand was super exciting to us. We're really, you know, thrilled to like have like, yeah, we put a circuit on and we got these legs to go. Um, but it also is very clearly a, a demonstration, right? It's, you know, these things are, are kind of scooting themselves along flat surfaces. Um, so there's a, a lot, a long way to go, but a lot of things that we're really excited about for this field. Um, and as we think about that, basically, I'd say there are kind of two, um, not two directions, but two types of, of, uh, of directions uh, that, that we're excited to go in. One is what, now that we've got the basic building blocks, what other features can you start to pack on to this tiny package, this tiny robot? And again, because of like the wild success of Moore's law and you know uh, the ability to pattern really small uh, electronics that have a lot of onboard complexity, one of the things is just adding all sorts of you know additional sensing, communication, memory, electronic components. Um, and then uh, there's also some things like you know. Uh, that you could add on to those more externally in the post fab, which would be like, you know, new actuators for these guys or, you know, acoustic transducers, all sorts of things to let them in, interact with their environments in different ways. 
Um, but motivating those changes are some, you know, application directions. And there are at least three that I think, uh, you know, as the field's moving forward that we're pretty excited about. One is swarm robotics. Uh, so basically, you know, uh, this is a macro scale swarm of robots, but you know, like I said, you you build these things, you know, in parallel, and you can build a bunch at once. Um, you know, I'm building on chip scale because it's R and D. But if you you know build you know these robots at, on you know your your eight inch six inch eight inch wafer, you know, industry standard, um, you could pack you know close to a million robots onto a single wafer uh, and release all those guys simultaneously, uh, and off you go. And so studying sort of these ridiculously large number of swarms of uh, potentially interaction interacting robots down. Uh, down the line in the future. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, in the world of micro robots, you know, environmental cleanup is an area that people are excited about. So could you have basically a, a swarm of tiny wallies that know how to go break down some nasty chemical and can do it selectively? Uh, you know, that raises all sorts of other questions, but it's at least something that has, I think, a lot of, a lot of potential. Um, and then finally, I think the kind of the gold standard is like biomedical applications, the sort of nano submarine, uh, you know, uh, version of a tiny robot. Um, and so, uh, I think I think I'm doing okay on time. So I'm just gonna walk you guys through then kind of census papers come out, some of these other directions uh, that we've been been playing with uh, in this world as well. Uh, so one big thrust for us, you know, uh, at, at Cornell uh, and now for me as well, uh, you know, for the time we've been at, at UPenn is uh, new actuators for these robots. Um, so we built these one robots with legs, um, but in principle, you could do a bunch of other things too. So I have a lab mate, Sam Norris, former lab mate, she's graduated now, but who built a little uh, solar powered bubble robot. So this guy is basically, um, uh, you know, uh, has a bunch of solar cells on board and is doing electrolysis of water to, you know, to swim. Uh, so, you know, forming hydrogen on one side and oxygen on the other, and that allows it to move itself around its environment. Um, uh, and so that's, you know, that's an approach to, to, you know, doing, you know, making robots that swim around. Um, and in principle, always turn to one side because there's two hydrogens and one oxygen. Uh, you guys are smart. Yes, that is exactly right. You can get around that. And Sam has, this is still my favorite video of hers. I think the turn is kind of fun. Uh, but, um, you basically, you could, you know, do, uh, one of each, you know, rocket on, on each side. And so she's proved that you can make it go straight. Uh, but they do have a natural turn to them exactly for the reason that you say, uh, you, you know, get a two to one ratio when you do electrolysis. Um, uh, so that's, that's, you know, one other actuator, so to speak, other way to, to move around. Um, uh, and then some of the folks at, at UPenn have been exploring um, electrophoresis. So the robots that you're seeing here, again, these little blocks are the solar cells for these robots. And then these are big exposed electrodes. Um, and the reason there are two sets is because uh, Will has basically designed um, uh, uh, a spatial light modulator, a fancy projector into the microscope so that he can selectively uh, shine light on one or the other. And now he can steer these guys around under his microscope. And so basically he's de designated a number of waypoints and the robots are supposed to follow each other to the waypoints and zoom around. So uh, he's really excited in particular, I think about some of the swarm robotic studies, um, but is uh, is also exploring this new, new actuator uh, to achieve that. Um, and then one of the things that you might want out of your new actuators uh, is the ability to um, go to different places. Uh, and so in particular, all the robots that I've showed you so far um, have to move in some sort of a fluid environment. Uh, and uh, after I, you know, did the, the wrote the paper that um, uh, I talked to you guys about today, I was talking with my advisor, Paul, and with uh, the, the professor who'd be my, um, my postdoc advisor at Cornell, Nick, we were like, you know, it'd be really cool. What would it take to build a leg that can work in air so that you could have a tiny robot that can run around on your desk? I don't know why I want that, but I really wanted it. Uh, and so that was the uh, the project that I took on in kind of the, the year and change uh, while I was, um, uh, you know, a, a postdoc at Cornell uh, after graduating. And basically the thing we adapted uh, is a little uh, ionic electroactive polymer uh, actuator. So these things have been built at, at big scales, but the idea is that you have a uh, um, a conductive polymer on each side, sandwiching a little polymer electrolyte membrane. And by applying voltages to this thing, you can drive ions back and forth within the actuator uh, to drive bending. So now instead of having your electrolyte bath be all around you and that be what you use to drive uh, actuation, it's all internal. Uh, and we actually got some of those actuators to work before I left Cornell. So here is a, a video of one of those guys uh, bending, kind of a side view. You're looking maybe like, you know, 30 degrees on to the uh, the little robot actuator. Uh, 
And so we're still working on uh, making these guys that walk on land. Uh, here's one that doesn't work, um, but it gets, uh, I think, a bit of an image of the sort of thing that we're hoping to build uh, that ultimately will work. And that's been a project that I've kind of continued and collaborated with folks in the Miskin group since moving over to UPenn. Um, so that's one kind of one area of, of ongoing work. Um, another is basically, like I said, you know, gee, like we basically just scratched the surface um, uh, of the sort of circuits that you could put on these robots. Um, uh, you know, uh, what else could you do? And there's work both at Cornell and at UPenn, and I'm gonna highlight some of the stuff that's going on uh, at UPenn, actually in collaboration with some folks at the University of Michigan, basically to build, it's a slightly larger uh, CMOS circuit now, um, that uh, goes from being just kind of like a, a little ASIC, something that's very task specific and you wire up to do some particular thing to something that's really programmable. And so Maya Lassiter is then the, the graduate student in Mark's group who's heading up this work uh, and basically, uh, you know, have a, a circuit that has on, on board a number of little sensors for, you know, uh, recognizing light and voltage and temperature, um, and then a more complex circuit so that, again, you can blink in light to it and program uh, its little onboard processor to do a number of different tasks. Uh, and so there was a, an IEEE paper that uh, came out about this guy, the circuit, uh, but Maya is also starting to get these robots um, uh, working as well. And we're, I'm just stupid excited uh, about, uh, about, you know, that side of the work and where it's going. Um, and then uh, the last thing that I'll highlight is, you know, again, we are motivated by these applications. And in particular, we started to scratch the surface uh, on some biomedical work. And so I'll just show a couple of, this is very fledgling work, um, but this is a, a fluorescence microscope image of um, a, a bundle of nerve cells. This is a dorsal root ganglia that's been excised from a rat by our buddies in the, the Cullen group, Melanie Hillman, a graduate student over there. And then this is one of my tiny robots. Uh, and the idea is basically to have these, uh, these uh, axons attached to the robot and uh, stretch grow the axons by having this robot you know, uh, run, run away with the axon attached to it. Uh, and so we're not there yet, but we're starting to play some games. So here's one of my robots, uh, you know, that I've, I've built in the past year. Uh, I'm going to shine the laser on it to power it. Uh, and if you watch carefully, the motion is subtle, but you can see it pull on this little bundle of axons. Uh, it kind of like looks like a bro with a stretch band. Um, uh, but, um, uh, you know, moving, moving that work forward uh, as well. Um, uh, the last thing uh, that I will highlight um, is something that is not, uh, it's not really robot work, uh, but it's uh, connected. So some of the same uh, same team that was part of the Cornell uh, robot side of things um, uh, from Paul's group and also uh, Al, the, the circuit designer, uh, also spun out a startup company uh, called OIC Technologies. Uh, and they have basically these, you know, what will be a functionally invisible little smart tags, where instead of building something that has legs and can move around, now they've connected it to um, uh, some sort of a light source, a little micro LED. And so uh, instead of, again, being a robot that, that runs around, it can blink out its name to you. Uh, and so, um, you know, the, the vision is you have these, you know, ubiquitous smart tags that you can put on anything. Um, uh, and so that's a, a startup company that's coming out of Cornell as well. And I mentioned that in part, oh, and uh, so this is the, the, again, we love Blender animations. Um, uh, so this is the, uh, the Blender animations of all those parts and pieces for this little smart tag, um, you know, 100 microns-ish in size. Uh, and I mentioned this in large part because um, I actually, uh, you know, got an offer from these guys. And so this is uh, um, the world that I'm about to go enter. I'm joining, uh, joining OEC here in just a little bit. Um, uh, and hopefully going to go, you know, make these tiny smart tags ubiquitous. But I think it's all part of this really cool ecosystem of tiny releasable electronics for robotics and sensing and all these sort of things. And I'm excited to continue to push that forward. Um, so uh, with that all said, uh, I will do a huge thank you to all of the lab mates and teammates uh, who made the work that I showed you today possible, uh, including especially the folks in the Miskin group, the Abbott group, uh, and, uh, uh, and the Cohen group, uh, as well as the McEwen group, uh, and uh, also all the funding agencies that, uh, that you know, provided support for this work. Um, and uh, I'm happy to uh, take any questions slash any discussion that uh, you guys find interesting. So thanks, uh, thanks so much for uh, your attention uh, during this talk and uh, for the opportunity to come, come join you guys. Uh, yes, James. So you knew I was going to have a thousand questions. Yeah, and I, I realized too, I uh, yeah, anyway, so I'm very happy to take them. I left myself a little chunk of time.
Uh, okay. Well, me, I'm going to ask one, one question then, and then I'll let somebody else have a chance because otherwise I'll just completely occupy your time. I, I'm, I'm not sure I understood how the mechanical actuators worked. And can you say just a little bit more um, about how those are actually moving and how those were developed, the actual, you know, making it actually move? Yeah, let me jump back there in the, uh, in the talk. Um, and I've got the fuzzies up now because I want to be able to see you guys. Um, uh, so... Um, again, the motivation, right, to, to build this into a, um, an integrated circuit was to have um, uh, something that responds to voltage. Um, and so uh, the, the structure uh, is this super thin um, uh, layer of uh, platinum and titanium, about 10 nanometers thick in total, um, uh, in cross section. Uh, and then essentially, as you apply voltages to that um, structure in solution, uh, the uh, adsorption of ions. So basically, when you apply a voltage, you get a, a coverage of ions building up on the surface, essentially to you know keep the charge neutral. Um, and usually, that charge layer doesn't do anything mechanical. But when you're super super thin, actually, the just the surface stress from this tiny layer of, of ions is enough to cause you to go from let's say a flat uh, structure, this super thin flat structure to something that bends. So basically- can you, can you say just a little bit more about surface stress? Is that, what what, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, no, sorry, thank you. This, these are good questions. Um, uh, basically, so, um, uh, you know, a, a bulk stress, right, would be, you know, you drive something into your, um, the, the bulk of your material um, and that generates expansion uh, and that causes, you know, causes bending right. and all those sort of things. Um, in this case, basically, uh, all you have is a tiny surface layer uh, of these ions, but basically they stretch the bonds at the surface of your structure. So you've got all these, you know, uh, charged things that are trying to pack onto that surface. Um, and uh, oh, it's that I tiny see. little stress right at the surface that drives, if you're thin enough, drives the whole thing to bend. So, so it's actually, a, 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 would it be, it's, it's called an ionic, but basically it's just the charge, right? You, you've got yeah. this difference in charge that's attracting this molecule and then the molecule is mechanically pushing itself in between the other molecules and causing those molecules to then be pushed apart is that exactly. correct that's a yeah a good schematic way to, to talk about it. okay all right and it thank turns you. Out, so yeah yeah thank you no i really appreciate it. these are the sort of things that um uh anyways it's yeah you know knowing your audience and all that but this is very much in my nano world and i kind of take some of it for granted probably um uh and I'll say just one more comment on that. So uh, why the heck did we make this out of platinum? And is it just because I like spending Paul's money? Um, the answer is no. Uh, it turns out that platinum uh, is um, basically ha has um, does a really good job. It, it has a higher, it can support a higher like, surface charge density of these little adsorbed ion states. Uh, and so uh, between that and platinum mostly being pretty um, uh, electrochemically um, it's a noble metal, so it doesn't just etch away in all sorts of environments that you put it in. But it also ends up being a really great choice because, again, you can pack these tiny ions on the surface uh, at higher densities than with other materials. So there's like a whole literature around um, uh, platinum and other noble metal like uh, supercapacitors because essentially, you know, as opposed to even just like a you know a typical capacitance when you you know have a, a metal in uh, fluid, these things pack on a lot more charges, and that basically gives you a, a bigger surface stress than you'd get if you chose a different material. So, um, all right, I, I knew I said I was only going to ask a question, but I, no, I, I have another question. So is it, is it, so basically in any kind of an actuator, you're, you're, you're usually trading off uh, uh, torque versus speed, right? Hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way of creating these in a way that they produce more torque, but they move less, or, you know, maybe they, they make, they move a, a far greater amount, but they don't uh, have as much strength. Or do you have to then resort to mechanical linkages? And are mechanical linkages possible? Uh, yeah, so those are all great questions. Um, uh, some of this is stuff that we've done some work on that kind of buried. Um, so let me start with, let's just say you wanted to stick with this structure, uh, but drive you know, um, more bending or higher force or all those sorts of things. Uh, you know, the dumb thing that you could imagine if this is a, you know, um, 
a capacitor, you just continue to dial up voltage ad nauseum and pack more and more charges on there. Because this is actually a chemical reaction, that doesn't exactly work, but it sort of does. So you basically saturate your adsorbed layer at some reasonably low voltage. But if you continue to dial up that voltage, you can um, oxidize a little layer of the platinum. So now instead of it just being uh, surface actuation, it starts to drive into the bulk a little bit. Um, and that gets bigger curvatures and bigger forces. But again, the trade-offs that you have, one is speed, um, that takes longer. Uh, and the other actually is durability. Now you're starting to do something where to undo that, you have to drive ions out of like a layer of your surface. And over time that beats up your surface. Um, so, you know, that's sort of a, a just this version. Um, uh, we've done, so I mentioned new actuators and we've done a chunk of work um, on some of those things as well. So like some stuff that's going on at Cornell that I didn't talk about, but is, okay, so we did this with a surface actuator. Could you actually build something now where you, you deliberately have ions that can drive all the way into the bulk? And there's some materials that allow you to do that. Um, uh, they do tend to be a lot slower, uh, but you get bigger forces out of them. And so depending on your application, uh, that's a trade-off that you can play. Um, and then, can, sorry, can you etch the Can you etch the surface in order to increase the surface area and then get more actuation or does that not work that way? Uh, so uh, you absolutely can do that. And in the supercapacitor world, that's a great idea. Um, doing that for an actuator creates some trickiness. Uh, well, for one, you know, our actuator here is, is 10 nanometers thick. So that's about like, you know, um, 30 atoms. Uh, and so you etch through it if you yeah you basically with this one you're you're all the way done already. Um, now you could grow it say over a textured surface and then release a wrinkly thing and there you'd have more um, uh, more sites per area. But your other thing that you're doing is um, uh, making, you're making it stiffer. Yeah, exactly. Just like a, a wrinkled piece of paper is a lot stiffer than a. And so again, it's a way to get you know you could probably get a higher force output, but you're you're throwing away a lot of. Um, bending curvature. Uh, so then can. second part of my question is, is there a way of working with linkages? Is there a way of like, you know, doing actual mechanical trade-offs between? Yeah, um, a lot of that actually, uh, and again, there's a, so I, I blew past this because it is, you know, I'm choosing what, what to include and what not to. Um, these are, all these things are folding parts, right? And so it's like this bending. And so there's a lot of work uh, within uh, Itai Cohen's group at Cornell, our collaborators, um, uh, that's inspired by origami. And so basically they've done some really cool uh, stuff, with origami style linkages to get, you know, trade off, you know, uh, force for bending amplitude and all that sort of stuff. And so there's a one paper out uh, also in science robotics uh, that I'm a co-author on, but that does some of that. And then future work to come that continues to explore like, you know, your sort of like um, origami inspired uh, uh, structures for actuators. Great questions, thank you. Somebody else better ask a question or I'm going to ask another one. We have about 10 minutes left, folks, so ask away, whoever wants one. <laughs> okay, that's long enough. All right, so um, next question I have is about the power sources. Yeah. Um, you, you talked about light, which, which uh -huh. obviously then kind of limits your um, environment, right? You have yeah, to absolutely. It. You can actually shine light into it. And then you yeah. talked a little bit about chemical energy. I was kind of curious about if you could say just a little bit more about that. I didn't, wasn't sure I understood what you were saying. Yeah, so I, I flashed that up there. Um, uh, so, right, the, the motivation behind that, um, anything in nature uh, is doing, is basically utilizing chemical. Oh, I say that, that's too strong. But most of your microorganisms, your cells in your body, a lot of the things that we talked about here, they either eat or take, you know, some sort of chemical from their um, environment and use that. Uh, um, the uh, and so you can play games where like you know people have done things you know interfacing with biological membranes and all this sort of stuff um, to to collect power. The trick is if you want to use that, if you want to basically um, well, go, it, you quickly get into some philosophical questions uh, around uh, if you are determined to use um, like you know, CMOS, silicon electronics, um, there's a challenge basically taking that energy source and whatever membranes, turning it into something electrical that they can then power your uh, your robot. People can do that, but it's not. it tends not to be very efficient. And so I haven't seen anything in that world, at least, that's both small 
and also provides the sorts of currents and voltages that we need, you know, for the for the tiny actuators and for the tiny circuits that we have. But it's I think it's in principle possible. Uh, it's not a, a field that I have enough background in to like want to just go do myself. But I think it's a really exciting um, place to live. Um, the other one other approach to tiny robots is let's not build things from scratch. Let's kind of hack nature. Um, and there you'd very much be leveraging these sort of like we're going to you know take a collection of cells and put them on some tiny object and get that to drive actuation in motion. Uh, and those guys do a, a you know a pretty good job as well. It, it becomes a, a pretty different approach. And I think the trick there is how do you how good a job can you do creating these sort of really programmable behaviors uh, out of that, particularly at a small scale? So uh, uh, that's that's my, uh, um, you know, I don't have like a, br a single brilliant thing on that, but I think that there, it's another area um, that's super interesting. Is um, there a space or a way to potentially make use of magnetic um, transfer of power, you know, magnetic fields, uh, have a coil collected, yeah. that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. So. Lots of people do that for just like um, kind of the more um, micro machine type of stuff, like I showed for a minute, where you just have your your three Helmholtz coils and you drive your tiny robot with those things. But you could imagine, and this is uh, this is absolutely right, doing some sort of um, magnetic powering uh, of the um, of the robot. Um, one trick with that is, you know, the, the easiest thing would be some sort of like a ring inductive coupling. But because that goes as area, if you work it out, essentially. As you shrink things down, that that approach doesn't work very well. Um, there is some interest in our group uh, in a field called magnetostrictives, uh, which uh, maybe I'm telling you guys things you already know, but I'll go for it anyways. Um, is basically a field where you, you pair a magnetic material with a piezoelectric, and so now your magnetic field pushes and pulls on your piezoelectric, uh, and that's what generates power. Uh, and in principle, uh, that can be pretty efficient, and so that might be a way down the line. Um, to uh, to harvest um, mechanic, uh, magnetic energy uh, at a really small scale. And I think the challenge with that approach um, is simply that you've got another structure that's sort of like a released cantilever that you have to, you know, move it at, you know, reasonably high frequencies to get power out of. Um, so the answer is absolutely yes. And I think there's lots of excitement about it and just like some technical tricks to doing it. The other, the other thing that is really, I think, a really good approach potentially, especially for biology, um, is acoustics. Um, uh, you know, when you go to the, when you go to the doctor, they ultrasound you. Uh, and so at the right wavelengths that travels really well through your body. Uh, and so, um, and there's even some work, you know, uh, doing kind of like neural probes that are remotely powered with, um, uh, you know, with acoustic power. And so I, I think there's like a whole, a whole exciting world of alternate power sources, uh, that's yet to be explored. Light, it turned out was a, a is a good one. Uh, and a particularly easy one because you can get those PVs directly from your silicon foundry when you build your circuit. Um, so speaking of vibrations, uh, hmm. have you guys realized that if a spy was able to walk into an office somewhere that had a window and sprinkle a bunch of those little light response bots with infrared emitters as opposed to visible light emitters and microphones to sense, you could then use a... Um, the, the idea here is that somebody speaks in the office, the microphone picks it up and blinks in infrared to mm. relay the sound wave out to a telescope that's watching through the window, which then amplifies the audio and uh, gives you the ability to listen in. There's been some amazing work done with uh, potato chip bags, uh, just using the vibration of the potato chip bag to, um, and, then, and then looking at the change in light uh, yeah. and then reproducing the audio from them. Yeah, I think, um, you know, oh. go ahead, sorry. Oh, James, I was gonna say, there's also been work done right off the window. You, you train a laser on the window and you pick up the- oh, Just uh, off the, the window, yeah. Just mm -hmm. off the window itself. Don't even need anything in the room. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I think uh, it's it's it highlights that this is at once a really exciting and a somewhat spooky world um, yeah. to work in. Uh, so, you know, uh, my goal out here is high transparency. Uh, you know, I get funded by by the national government, uh, not through military things right now, and so I get to tell you guys everything I'm doing. I don't have to try and be sneaky. But it is, that, you know, all of these things. You know, um, yeah, you can imagine some some pretty crazy applications. Um, I think again, you know, 
you know, we're not there right now. Uh, some sick, tricky technical challenges to, to get all the way there. But certainly if, you know, uh, if things continue to develop, there, there'd be some really, really wacky and, and exciting and also spooky applications for these sort of things, I think. Uh, last question in the last couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious about, it, so, so there's this kind of effect where it seems like whenever a new technology comes along, all the old technologies immediately get thrown away, even the parts of the old technologies that actually still work. So like mechanical computing was then replaced by analog computing and analog computing was replaced by digital and now it's all machine learning. And if you aren't doing machine learning, like why are you breathing? Uh, <laughs> attitude. <laughs> See, you laugh, so I know that No, you... I'm laughing because I'm. that was exactly what I ran into this week. <laughs> <laughs> so we were again, having discussions of why <laughs> why yeah exactly so so one of the things i'm kind of curious about is if if there are opportunities so we've already seen analog um you know being used mostly in, in power and signaling and that kind of thing in, in, in what you're doing mm -hmm. but i'm also kind of curious about um, opportunities for mechanical computing or you know I, I don't know maybe just mems devices or you know something like that in this in this work yeah. Um, so again, I, you know, the story that I told, um, uh, well, I stand by, you know, the story that I told, but I think there's, an, um, this may, you can tell me if this does or doesn't answer your question. I think that in parallel with the sort of work that we're doing, which is very much like, yeah, gee, let's put like, you know, put electronics on board and that's the way you're going to make these things smart. There's a lot of excitement, um, uh, about sort of like, um, mechanical intelligence or materials intelligence where without sort of having sensors on board, basically you're building tiny structures um, that, you know, when they experience some stimulus, they, they have, you know, built in maybe still some sort of an energy source, but know how to respond to that uh, in some kind of like, you know, um, designed or pre-programmed way. Just, um, just based on their shape. Just based on shape. Yeah. And so that's certainly, that's not the work that I've kind of been, mo I've definitely been engaged in like, you know, gee, that, that sounds great, but I actually think, you know, maybe you get some things by, by having real digital control on board. Um, yeah. uh, but I think it's also a really exciting field and I don't mean to, um, yeah, I, I think it's an exciting field with a lot of, a lot of cool work going on in it. Um, uh, and I think too, you know, one of the things I'll say is, um, so if you look at the size of the sorts of robots that are building, and I probably should emphasize this more, um, they are like, uh, 100 microns ish plus in size, uh, and in principle you could design some circuits. You know we're not at like the the very most modern transistor no, node size, so you could continue to shrink your circuit down to a certain size. But you know below 10 tens of microns, you really like you know you don't have a functional circuit at that point. You have a few transistors. Um, uh, that's overstated, but it's it's kind of functionally true. You need a reasonable number to actually do these sorts of uh, computational tasks. And so I think especially as you're trying to build things that are on the smaller end of micro robots, you're going to have to lean on that. There's just not really another option. Um, like, like moving to analog circuits to do things instead of always depending on digital or, yeah. or doing mechanical. Or mechanical. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so I, I think that, the, uh, you know, you get, you know, you only get to do so much in this life and I've embraced sort of the digital approach. And I think that that's, um, good and challenging and all that sort of stuff. But I'm glad that there are people working on the other approach too. And I think that there's some nice complementarity between them. All right, one minute over and wow, what a talk. Absolutely loved it. Totally uh, amazed at what you're doing. Thank you guys. It's super fun to, I mean, just the sorts of questions you guys are I just, you know, the, the whole appeal of this for me was talking to people who love this sort of stuff. Uh, and, you know, I get a huge kick out of that and, and love the work as well. So really, thank you guys so much for the invitation. Yeah, thank you much for uh, talking, Michael. This is wonderful. Yeah. So very good talk. Awesome. Okay, with that, I think we've come to the end of the meeting. Um, if folks want to hang around and continue to talk, I can leave the meeting open. Uh, with this, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Great. So let's see. Oh, uh, Michael, could you stop sharing your screen actually awesome. so I can get to my control panel? <laughs> Sorry, no problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And again, I, I probably have a couple minutes if there were more people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. Guys, 